the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to this morning's worship service. We have a few announcements that I'd like to go over, and they're obviously very important ones as well. Um, I have here the beautiful poster of Jean Kim, and she will be responsible for the uh, um, piano dedication concert, which is next Sunday. So there's the information on that, and there's a sign up for that, and we hope everybody can make it to that in celebration of this wonderful piano we have and in celebration of the gifts that made it possible and particularly the gift of life uh, of Harlan um, and uh, Dorothy Parmenter uh, in whose name this, this piano has been dedicated. So that's next week. There'll be a 15 minute dedication service followed by about a 45 minute concert and then following that of course will be uh, refreshments. So I want to draw that to your attention and lift that up and if anybody needs a ride, then you be sure and let the office know and we'll make sure that happens. Talking about rides, if anybody needs a ride to, um, to the presentation that Brent and I have put together of our trip to the Holy Land, that is on the 8th uh, of uh, November from 6 to 8 or thereabout. And it will be uh, an opportunity. We'll have some soups and we'll have some goodies and during which I'll, I'll show uh, uh, slides of our trip. And I, that should be quite a bit of fun, very exciting. And of course, that'll be at the twilight time, and I do realize that some people are, not, are, are limited by their driving. And so if anybody needs a ride that evening, call the office, and we'll make sure to take care of that. Also, I'd like to draw to your attention, and very important, of course, is that we have our annual Nyaka Banquet, and uh, I don't know what it is, a 12th or 10th, I'm not sure which one, but that'll be this coming Saturday, and there's a, uh, a notice of that in the bulletin as well. With that said, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Mr. Pease. Yes, I am. Uh, <coughs> um, all the things that David just um, mentioned, uh, their sign-up sheets are in the NARPEX, uh, if you want to get details. And the Nyaka benefit is Saturday, I have a sign-up sheet here for volunteers. We have 14 people who have volunteered to help us. Uh, and we really need uh, <coughs> younger people with muscles to help us, uh, if you could, uh, especially for uh, cleanup and taking down um, uh, the event next Saturday. I will have this sign-up sheet at the uh, script table. If you can help us, there's a variety of ways to help. We really, really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, then we'll begin our worship with silence. <coughs> salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Please rise, those able, and we'll sing hymn number 288, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. <laughs> Oh, 
reconciled us to himself through Christ. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. Do we have any children today? Ah, yes. Kennedy, how are you? You look so pretty today. Of course, you always do. What are you doing that for? You look crabby this morning. You crabby today? No? Okay. How are you? Hey, did you sing today? Did you like that? Was that fun? What's your teacher's name? You forgot it? Shannon. Is it Shannon? Yes. Oh, Shannon. yes. Shannon? Yes. Shannon. Shannon. Yes. Shannon. Is she nice? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I had a teacher whose name was Shannon Glenn. Shannon Glenn. That sounds so Scottish, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, I want to ask you something. I wonder if you guys know anything about this. Okay, I got a word. Let's see, if, let's see if you can tell me what this word means. Are you ready? Who am I going to ask? Want me to ask you? Do you know what a lie is? Oh, it means that you, you tell you're going to do something, but you didn't do it. Do you know what a lie is? It's good. Like you said, someone said, did you steal the bike? Did you, you steal did. the bike? And then you say what? No, you didn't do it. You did. Ah, lying is okay. Do you know what lying is? What is it to you? That's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? It's when you're not telling what? Oh, it's like you didn't do your homework, but you said you did it. So who'd you lie to? Oh, bad idea. <laughs> That's right, bad idea. Um, do you think it's okay to lie, Benjamin? Um, Why not? What if it gets you out of a jam? It's bad. It, it's bad. Why is it bad? Because lies, lies are bad. Because hmm? God, God doesn't want you to lie. Well, that's pretty true also. Hmm. Um, let me think. 
Um, if if your parents, first of all, I have a question. Do your parents love you? Yeah. yeah. Do they want to hurt you? Yeah. No, they don't. So if they tell you something, is it supposed to hurt you or to help you? Help yeah. you. Yeah. So if your parents say to you, don't tell a lie, why are they telling you that? Because they want what? They want you to be good. Yeah. So when your parents say to you, um, Rahan, don't tell a lie. <laughs> you know what? You're the second person I've ever known that's never told a lie. George Third, Washington. really. Who's the first? Jesus. Who's the second? Ta-da! <laughs> so you're the other guy. Come here. You, uh, oh. <laughs> you never told a lie? Uh, but uh, she says she's never told a lie. See, <laughs> that's a grandpa said, not that he knows of. All right, have you ever told a lie? Little one? Yeah. Well, we all do. We've all told lies. So, I would just tease. Okay. Why? <laughs> Carter, have you ever told a lie? Yeah, I, that's that. Ah, <laughs> So. If, if your mother and father tell you never tell a lie, it's because they love you. Because when you tell lies, who do you hurt? Jesus who is up there. Jesus who is up there, okay. Who I else do you hurt? You hurt God, sort of, okay. Who else do you hurt? Uh, if you tell a lie um, and you get in trouble, who else do you hurt? Not really. Jesus? Not really. <laughs> you hurt yourself. What? Okay. What? Yeah. You were close. Yeah, you were close. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> well, now this is this is the speaking part, okay? Who do you think is the creator of lies? Who has who makes the worst lies the in all? Who? The devil. The devil. Uh, so that's right. The devil. That's down there. That's down there. <laughs> he's bad, and he's the biggest liar in the whole world. So if you're telling lies to your parents, to your brothers and sisters, to your teachers, I don't know about that, but guess who you're acting like? The devil. You're acting like the devil. So if you don't want to act like the devil, Benjamin, what are you supposed to do? Not lie. Not lie. Because when you, act, when you lie, you act like the devil. And that's a bad thing to be. And when you tell the truth, who do you act like? God. And? Jesus. And Jesus. Because Jesus. Or maybe the pastor. The dog. And the pastor. <laughs> and, and maybe the pastor, too, he said. Oh. No, that's right. <laughs> I agree with you. Oh. Are we singing the song? Are the children singing the song? Number eight? All right, who else wants your stir and stir and stir and stir? Okay. Stand up here with Rohan. Who else wants to sing? Let's stand up here. Come on. Come on, you can stand up here. You can scoot over this way. Got this good lad here. He's going to sing also. All right. Okay, you ready? Play through it one nice throw one time.
young man. Now, I want you to sit here and I want you to listen to the choir sing a song to you, okay? That's right. singing so strong in the full voice. We now turn our attention to our uh, concerns of the church universal and the church particular. <coughs> How is everything going in the Middle East? Uh, Not good. Man. Your parents? So far so good. So far yeah. so good. Yeah. All right. And uh, the uh, Hamatis? Okay. And Tripoli? Right. Yeah. And Reem? And Baby? And Doing fine. Matthew? Yeah. All right. All right. We have a lot, as, as most people know, we have a, a lot of people, members and friends of this fellowship, and related to people, a good number of people in this fellowship, who are from Lebanon in the Middle East, and so what's going on there affects this fellowship uh, uh, dramatically, and so 
we'll lift them up and hold them in our prayers. Any other concerns? Any? Yes, Mr. Uh, this is not a concern necessarily, but this is an update on Justin Gash. So if you remember Justin, he was a graduate student in mathematics and was a member of our congregation for several years. He had a faculty at Franklin College. Uh, and I saw Justin yesterday. Uh, a year ago, when I reported on Justin, uh, he was having terrific back pains and his legs were hurting him very much. And in fact, the second semester, they put him on half time because it was so bad. Yesterday, he was doing well. Good. Uh, he had a hip replacement surgery, and he refers to it as his bionic hip. <laughs> and so he was all smiles, and he will have his knee replaced in another year. But I thought you'd like to have the update and know that some of your prayers have been answered. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I've told this story before, and it's a happy story, and, it's a, and I'm happy to hear about Justin. Um, Justin fell in love with this lovely woman, and uh, I'll never forget this. I was asked to do the, the, the wedding, and it was, it was in uh, southern Illinois, and we're in this little ante room, not, not a, I'm still in that room there, <clears throat> and we're standing out there, and they're, they're playing the music, <clears throat> And uh, he's going to walk in while his bride is walking down. And this is what he's doing. He's going, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't wait to get married. It was, it was just a happy, give me chills right. He was the happiest thing. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. And Bill, thank you for all the, for all the help. I don't know exactly what um, uh, the disorder that he had, but he was <clears throat> stunted growth and his legs <clears throat> were, were, they didn't work very well. <clears throat> and he'd had many, many operations on him. He walked with crutches and uh, just a wonderful man and very funny and very brilliant. Well, tell him hi, folks. Will you please do that? Thank you so much. Um, glad you're back, Mr. Uh, Haiti. Did you have a good time? I'm sorry you and your wife had to go to Europe for a couple of weeks, but you had a good time. <laughs> we had a very good time. How's the baby doing? Great. How bad? He's, uh, he's ready to talk. Oh dear. No, I'm just <laughs> well, that's good. Um, back there. Uh, Julie had uh, shoulder reconstruction surgery uh, Monday, and she's doing great. She's not quite ready to go last year, but uh, she's doing very well. And, uh, appreciate the support good. <clears throat> Prayer for Stephanie as she does her chrysalis flight walk this weekend and Ali and Yasmin are with her. Okay. Yes, Mr. Pease. My cousin Diane for health and housing and my dear friend Lenny for health. Alright. All right. Sarah, you're well? I'm on in the man. On the mend, all right. We'll put you down and pray for you, girl. Thank you. I'd like to do that. All right. If you'd be so kind, let us turn our attention to prayer. Gracious and heavenly God, by your generosity and your love for us, you have favored us with a splendid fall day. You've um, brought the winds and the colder breezes and it's a mixture of joy and we're thankful for that we're thankful um, for the trees and the colors we're thankful for the birds and we're thankful for this fellowship that also has been brought together in just a perfect array of, of humanity just like nature diverse and beautiful and sparkling and different there's no sameness here. And it's in that diversity, diversity this, this great strength in you comes. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful um, also, Lord, that um, you are seeing over our friends, all of our friends, in the Middle East. And we pray uh, for the Hadads and the Hamatis. And we pray for um, Reem Deeb and her family. And we pray for our good friends in Syria. We pray for our friends in Israel, Palestine, and ask that the Prince of Peace 
might be spoken clearly and kindly there. And that people, all peoples, would study war no more, but rather would beat their um, swords into plowshares and be about the process of growing and building and harvesting and sharing instead of the insanity of destruction. We pray for the peace of the Middle East, indeed peace everywhere. <coughs> Our mindful that peace begins with us and that peace only comes from Jesus Christ. <coughs> and so we would pray that any warfare we might have with our Creator, we would study that no more. We're mindful of many people in this fellowship who are not well, many friends of this fellowship who are not well. And so we, we lift up to you Justin Gash, grateful for the healing that's going on in his life, and ask, uh, ask that it would continue. And that Julie Hamm would continue in her um, restoration to wholeness, that she might return to us soon. We pray for Alan's friends, um, Diane and Lenny, and ask that they be brought to wholeness as well. And Reverend Sarah, that you would be with her uh, as she continues to be renewed. Bless her and, and let her uh, enjoy your company. We pray for Stephanie as she begins this wonderful journey of maturing in Jesus Christ. And it begins when we're just barely teenagers. And we ask that on this retreat that she uh, encounter uh, a new kind of faith, a, a, a joyful kind of faith. We'll also lift up to you our um, younger adults and we ask blessings upon their mentor, Mihi, and blessing upon the, um, the U. Kirk movement and that this church and the good friends at First Presbyterian would continue this united effort and that our college-age students would, uh, would blossom uh, in, in new faith and a blessing upon me, he, and the good work that she's doing. Gracious and heavenly God, we're grateful that you have granted success to Kim Jiyoon. We're grateful that um, she has been brought back to us today. We anticipate a wonderful coming weekend and blessings upon the Parmenter family as we give thanks for this wonderful gift. Father God and our Lord Jesus Christ, this prayer is imperfect. This one is not. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much, and we continue now with the sharing of our tithes and our offerings.
God, by your hand, you have given us gifts beyond compare. By your direction, you have compelled us to share these gifts with others. That in sharing, people would see how we have come um, to have received the blessings of God ourselves. So as we give that which you have given us to others, may you be glorified, may your word prosper, and may this world become however better. In Christ's name this we pray. Amen. And please be seated. You will find in your bulletin the scriptures that we're going to enjoy right now. Zechariah 8, 16 through 17. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth. And render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against your neighbor. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all of this, declares the Lord. And this. John 8, beginning with 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For is there, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. They're talking about Satan here. The devil. Yet, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Word of God for the people of God. Praise be Praise to God. The reason you don't believe me is you don't hear me. With the uh, communicants class today, and we were talking about the different voices <clears throat> that that try and capture our attention, and, and that was the lesson. And it was kind of interesting. I. Um, and the voices you follow is the voice you believe and the voice you believe is your God <clears throat> so be careful about what you're listening to 
and who you're listening to. Well, anyway. Now, I have to say this is, I, I, I know some people may not believe this, but that's all right. Um, as you know, <clears throat> I wouldn't and I couldn't, and I wouldn't even if I could, talk about who I may or may not vote for. So I'm not interested in that. And I'm sure you're not interested in that either. Um, so that, that, that's beside the point. At least I hope you're not interested in that. I wouldn't be. So this <clears throat> meditation really has nothing to do with that. Um, so don't, don't think that. I'm not trying to change your vote this time, Swale. It's okay. <laughs> I would recant of that also. Anyway, not surprisingly, uh, over the past few months of this election cycle, my thoughts have turned, or really I should say, they have been turned to all the candidates, what they've got to say, and specifically their line. Now, if it were merely the preposterous promises that they make, um, and, and trying to convince us of that, well, that would be one thing. Or if it were um, the equally mind-numbing twisting of facts that they, <clears throat> that they enjoy doing, and the what is is, and parsing of words, and this kind of silly stuff. Okay, I kind of get that. I think it's foolish. But what distresses me the most are the bold-faced lies they suffer upon the, the public. I mean, the bald-faced lies. I'm not talking about you know, white lies. And, and then when they get caught in the ball face lies, they compound it. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> I, I've said this before, but this truth, <clears throat> I told my daughter when she was growing up, I said, I want to tell you something, pal. Always tell the truth, because if you get caught in a lie, it's going to be a whole lot worse. And a whole lot worse. And she had to learn that lesson once. And what happens with parents is they feel sorry for their children. You know, they've scared them or they've punished them enough, and so they let them off the hook, and so you end up raising a bunch of brats. Now, lying is one thing you absolutely cannot permit your children to do. But, anyway. Lies, bald-faced lies by these candidates from all sides, all levels of government, okay? All levels of government. I heard a whopper the other day. Uh, it was from a candidate, I believe this candidate is from Missouri. Uh, he said of his opponent that so-and-so wants to tase seven-year-old children, quote-unquote. You know what a taser is? <clears throat> you know, you get, them, get their attention that way again. That's what they, you know, the candidate wanted to tase seven-year-old children. Now, what the opponent really said was, if I, if I understood this correctly, I think I did, was that if a seven-year-old was in a lethal position to harm others, appropriate force was necessary to save others from being harmed. And if that appropriate force meant you had to tase a seven-year-old, then you do it. That seems reasonable to me. But, <laughs> no, no, he wants to tase seven-year-olds. Well, okay. Now, I don't think we lie any more today than we did 100 years ago uh, or uh, whenever humankind started, okay? And from an unscientific analysis, <coughs> my guess is that lying is a psychological defense mechanism to, to protect someone, to protect one, I should say, from harm. That, that's, that's my guess. You know, we lie that, to protect ourselves, or at least think we're protecting ourselves when we lie. It's also a means of deflecting others from the truth. Um, I don't know if you've known anybody that deflects the truth. That's a, that's a, a liar's do. Why? Because the truth reveals who one really is. That's what truth does. Truth 
reveals who you really are. Lying covers up who you really are. So you think. Truth. It's a big, bright light that reveals your heart. And it reveals your soul. And it reveals your sacred condition. After all, truth is sacred. After all, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the bringer of truth. Jesus is the bringer of truth and light. Those who abide in him no longer deceive, nor are they afraid of being exposed. <coughs> um, it's sort of a fancy word, but I like the idea, I like the word congruency. And that is who you are on the outside and who you are on the inside. I like that word. I like that. So, uh, now, um, yeah, congruent. Liars are not congruent. Liars are not on the inside that they present themselves on the outside to be. Liars cover up their nefarious deeds. Liars cover up their cover-ups. Liars lie about the line. Jesus brings the truth. Those who abide in him speak truth. The author of lies, <coughs> the father of lies, abides in the comfort of darkness and deception. Consequently, when one knowingly lies, he or she serves Satan. When you lie, you serve Satan. Now, I'm going to say this, and I know it's going to be offensive to people, and I do care. When a, com when a comedian, yeah. When a politician lies, he or she is serving Satan. And if you're going to vote for a liar, you're going to vote for Satan. And it is not enough to say, well, this is what they all do. Well, then they're all liars. That's what they are. They're all liars then. Personally, I think most of them are. So if you're going to vote for it, Mr. X or Miss X, and they're a liar, you are voting for the power of Satan. Well, I'm not either, David. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And that's who you follow. That's who you obey. That's who gives you meaning in life. The dark world. Well, David, you don't understand the nuances of political language. Yes, I do. They're liars. <laughs> I understand that very well. They're liars. You don't understand what's the great one? Laws, David, you don't, you're just so... Um, ignorant about this. It's like making sausage. No, it isn't. It's, make, it's, it's about lying. If you vote for a liar, you vote for Satan. The author of lies abides in the comfort of darkness and deception. Consequently, uh, when one knowingly lies, that person, he or she, serves Satan. Well, that's naive, David. No, it isn't. That's mature. That's mature. It's not naive. I was naive when I voted for some boneheads who are liars. That's naivete. <clears throat> Now, lying takes on many forms, and its most acceptable form, other than in politics, is exaggeration and embellishment. I've told this, this story before. Uh, you ever been with the person? Chuck has. He's a good, out, uh, a good, witsy sort of guy. Yeah, I went fishing the other day, and I, I caught a bass this big. That's, <laughs> that, that's called a lie. That's called a white lie. It's also a funny lie, and everybody knows that's a lie that's funny. You know? So that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but anyway, uh, embellishment and exaggeration 
it, it is certainly a form of deception, and as such, it's a, it's a form of lying. And it finds its root in low self-esteem. People who embellish, people who lie, uh, uh, people who exaggerate have low self-esteem. You ever notice this? People who are solid, who are, uh, don't brag. And when they do, they do it in a way where everybody knows they're being funny. I mean, you know, seriously. So Hale brags, and, he, and I know he's being funny, he doesn't mean it, but he talks about how good looking he is. <laughs> oh, we know that's not true. But I mean okay. it, I mean it. <laughs> but, but we humor him, see? So he's not lying about it, he's delusional. <laughs> I love you too, David. <laughs> and I'm not lying. Look, I, I know you're not lying. So, uh, you know, okay, so I understand that when we're being funny, that's acceptable. But when, when a person has as part of their character, that they continually have to embellish, they have to, they have to exaggerate, and, and they, it's clear they have low self-esteem. They regale us with their list of important people they know. They tell us about all the important uh, things that they've accomplished. They, they, they tell us all of this stuff, uh, their achievements, and, and what they've seemingly secured, but it's still lying, and it's still living in darkness. And the sad and funny thing at the same time uh, about this form of deceit is that most hearers recognize the lie, and this is the sick word, not, and that's, this is a sad word, they pity the liar. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're shaking your head. You pity them. Because there's nothing you can do about it. They're, they're going to die liars, they're going to die serving the dark world, and there's nothing you can do about it. This is part of who they are. And remember that in uh, no, a lot of you wouldn't. It's, uh, those of you who are a little older remember, you know, in, in the Watergate uh, hearings, you know, the lie after lie after lie that was going on. <laughs> sat there. Oh, boy. Dan Inouye, that I pronounced the name of the guy from Hawaii, he said of Nixon that, damn liar. <laughs> and that's what you had. The kind of deceit. Well, what lying is is rebellion against God. See, we have, two, we have two words. We say, it's okay to lie, uh, and it's okay that I serve God. You can't have it that way. You, you just can't do it that way. Lying is rebellion against God and Christ. The biblical paradigm, as you all know, is in the story of Adam and Eve. There they are in the garden. When the first couple are caught by God uh, in their rebellion, the Lord says to them, why did you do this? Why did you eat of the forbidden fruit? Adam says... Because he was afraid. Also, his wife made him do it. Not his wife. Eve made him do it. <laughs> uh, see, liars pass on the blame. You ever notice that? They pass on the deceit. <laughs> I didn't do it. Uh, my opponent. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I didn't do this. Somebody else did it. The general. It's his fault. Her fault. I don't care. It's always somebody else's fault. Let's see, that, that's Satan. It serves Satan by passing it on. It's the deceit. I didn't do it. I'm not responsible for this. The devil made me do it. No? Whatever it is. Uh, Adam says he was afraid. That's the lie. Eve says because she was deceived. That's a lie. They both lied. And both now suffer, well, not now, with fear, shame, and guilt. That's the fruit of lying. Fear, shame, and guilt. That's what you get by living outside of the garden. And by that I mean by not living in communion with Christ. Uh, most lie to protect themselves from punishment. Think about that. Liars already know they're guilty, unless they're so far into the lie, that they, which is really pathological, you know, that now believe the lie is really the truth. And I suppose some of you have been around people that are so deep in the deceit to themselves that they don't even know they're lying. I know a couple of people like that. And anyway, most liars already know they're guilty. So often, as with politicians, again, they deflect the blame onto others. He made me do it. The serpent made me do it. The devil made me do it. Um, this person's really responsible. I couldn't have done that. I tell the truth. I'm a politician. <laughs> How dare they say I'm telling a lie? I'm a politician. I love you. Vote for me and I'll take care of you. I'm a politician. 
It's impossible for me to lie because I'm a politician. The devil made me do it. No, you did it. Your fear, your shame, your guilt, your pathological distortion in your soul made you do it. Don't blame it on the devil. And as a consequence, you have condemned yourself, not God. You have condemned yourself, not Jesus. And your punishment is self-deserved. That's the spooky thing about this. And you think not, consider your children, your little angels, right? As, as God figures, parents, you provide food, shelter, medical care, housing, you know, send them to school, give them what they want, clothing, whatever. Most importantly, you give your children love. And all you ask is a measure of obedience, right? Not much more. And you ask for obedience not to harm them, uh, but to protect them. You say, I don't want you, I eat a plane on the freeway, uh, you know, when you're two years old. You know, I don't want you to do that. And I expect you to obey me. It's real simple. You know, and, I, and I'm saying don't play on the freeway, not because I hate you, I happen to like you. Your parents have told me they like you, you know? And, and so they don't want you harmed. And all they want you to do is to obey them. That's, that's all that is. But what do your children do eventually? Well, they tell fibs, they blame their sibs. <laughs> and if children are not proof of the uh, curse of original sin, then I don't know what with. Because sooner or later, they'll all start lying. And they'll break your hearts. The problem with lying and being lied to is that it establishes a wall, a, a, a barrier uh, between, between others. And as a result, it erodes trust. I've only known a few pathological liars in my life, and one of the things that I knew is I literally couldn't tell them anything because they'd go tell their gossipy friends. I knew that. I knew, and I know some today, if I tell them one thing I know, that by the end of the day, they'll get on the phone and tell their friends. I know that. And so, I, so they can't be trusted. I'm not like them, but I can't trust them. Because I know who they serve, and they do not serve God. They serve darkness. That's what liars do. That's what embellishers do. That's what exaggerators do. They serve the dark world. All of which delight Satan, this disruption in this erosion in, in community, in fellowship, in, in uh, camaraderie. And that's what lying does, and that's what unravels families. That's what unravels families, is lying. Now, the solution is truthfulness. Because when we're truthful, it creates community. When we're honorable, it creates fellowship. When we're honest, it builds up families. And everybody here knows what I'm talking about. Everybody here knows what I'm talking about. So, <clears throat> what I encourage people to do, and certainly my family is a very imperfect um, Example. I know what I'm talking about because of the mistakes that our family made. So I'm not, you know, saying anybody's worse than anybody else. But when you speak truth, um, when you speak honorably, when you speak honestly, things by and large get okay. When you tell lies because you're afraid, when you uh, uh, offer deceit knowingly, then the only thing that can happen is, is destruction. And that's why I tell people, if you're involved with that, you're involved with Satan. And I didn't say that. Jesus says that in the 8th chapter of, of John. That's who you serve. That's who you serve. If you're going to be a liar. If you're not going to be a liar, then you're going to serve Christ Jesus. And that means you're going to be open, thoughtful, honorable, decent, measured, you're not going to exaggerate. You're not going to embellish. You're not going to tell stories. 
and you know you can be trusted. That's what I hope all people would want to be. Amen. You'd be so kind. Uh, please stand and let's share our closing hymn, Oh, for a Closer Walk with God, 396. Blessings upon this fellowship. We ask that you be with those who are friends who are in harm's way. We ask that you be with those whose bodies are not well. And would you, you invade and occupy those bodies and, and restore them to good health. We ask also that the Lord Jesus Christ and that his mightiness and his sweetness and his goodness and his truth rest upon every single person now and forevermore. Amen.